Hello, it's time for an update on the autonomous wheelchair rover project, which is actually a little bit autonomous now. And I decided that I should stop calling it a wheelchair. I should try and call it a rover from now on because it's not really much of a wheelchair anymore. Uh, so I've done quite a bit of work on it. So I'll just sort of briefly show you what's going on here. You can probably have a little guess. Uh, we now have the GPS on here and there's also the orange pie on there and uh, I'll just open this box up so you can see what's going on there. Some of this is, was already here before but now it's all just um, a bit more nicely packaged together and the orange pie is now connected to the Arduino that's controlling the rover by an I squared C connection so there's just the ground SDA and SCL wires going between them um, and the orange pie is being powered from the wheelchair. Uh, I'm using a separate back to do that, it's just a, a 5 volt step down over there. And I looked up online and apparently you're not supposed to power these orange pies using the pins, like the GPIO pins. So I soldered that voltage regulator into a micro USB connection there, that's the white one that I'm trying to film there. Uh, so that's how I'm powering it like that and it draws very little power especially when it's not doing anything it's been running off the wheelchair battery like this for about five days now and it's really hard to tell exactly how much power it's drawing because I'm too lazy to put a current meter on it so I've just been using my voltmeter and the one that I have out here in the garage only has 0.1 volt resolution and it takes even after 48 hours or so, I, I can't really tell if it's used up 0.1 volts of um, charge from the battery. So basically you don't need to worry about how much voltage and power it's drawing. It's almost nothing, even though it has a little fan running on there. Uh, so it's great that it's such low power, uh, and the Arduino of course is extremely low power as well. Um, so I've just left it running, and fortunately I can actually access the Wi-Fi on this even though I put it in the garage which has thin um, steel walls and close the door it still manages to access the the Wi-Fi router inside my house it's quite convenient um, so it all just sits here running and I never turn it off at this point um, I made up a few more cables uh, this one here is for powering the light it's just a uh, visible light LED light there. I have an infrared one as well which I'll put on later on and give that a try too because the FPV camera that I have there is a IR sensitive one so I should be able to drive this around in the dark and see what's going on without actually having a visible light showing and this on here I put this on because the light was a little bit too strong in one spot in the middle of the screen and this sort of uh, packing foam stuff diffuses it quite nicely to spread out the light so that it's not so uh, strong in one single point. Um, what else have we got going on here? So this stuff I think I showed you before, that's just a uh, power transistor to turn the light off and on and it's being connected to a couple of GPIO pins to the orange pie. Circuit wise, apart from the I squared C bus being now connected between these two, the only other thing I've added is the compass connections to the orange pie so programming wise um, most of the work has been done in reading the compass values and uh, doing calibration process storing that to file and or loading it from the file instead of calibrating every time um, that's where most of the programming work has gone well actually now quite a lot of the programming work has actually gone into the user interface on the the web interface where now I can do searches and give the rover a path to follow and it follows it fairly well as much as can be expected for this level of resolution GPS and the one meter squares that I've partitioned my yard into considering those limitations it's actually doing fairly well so I'll show you a bit of that at the end of the video I actually recorded quite a lot of it probably enough to bore you but um, We'll get to, that, get to that later on. Uh, this FPV up here, I was not actually using that at the time I was doing my roving autonomous test because it will probably 
interfere with the GPS a little bit of being that close. So I just put this on afterwards to try driving around at night in FPV and see how well the light was working to let me see where I was going. So um, I think I'll show you a little bit of that as well. It wasn't very exciting. Um, it turns out that this point here is a little bit low really to see where you're going, especially when you get into some of that long grass out there. So it would be better if the camera was up here, but uh, well, that's, uh, it works well enough. Uh, so yeah, this is just mounted on wood. There was four very convenient bolts on the base of the chair, or the top of what would have been the base of the, the part that you sit on. Uh, it's very nice and square and flat, so I just put a couple of beams across there and then a couple of, um, or a few of these like that. So this whole section here can be taken off in a minute or so, and I can bring the whole thing inside if I want to change the program on the Arduino. Basically, that's the only reason I need to take it inside at the moment. Uh, or if I want to do some soldering, it's easier to do it at my desk. Uh, otherwise, as far as the Orange Pi is concerned, all of the programming and uh, changes to code can be done from inside because it's accessing that through the Wi-Fi. Very convenient. Um, this post here, <laughs> it's just a piece of firewood that I found in the wood pile. Seems like it was the perfect size and uh, shape. I didn't want something too thin. I wanted it to be fairly thick and solid because I didn't want it to be wobbling. So um, that's worked out quite well. I just nailed it in from the bottom and this has all been working fairly well so far. So the way that this is working at the moment is that the Orange Pi is con continuously sending two numbers to the Arduino all the time and they are the uh, basically the pitch and roll equivalents of this here and telling it which way to move. Now whether, whether the Arduino actually pays any attention to that or not is determined by this switch here. So if I turn this to the middle position it should start driving to a point sort of over there where I've set the beginning of the search path at the moment just to quickly show you that. Uh, I'll show you in, inside, I'll go inside and show you on the user interface what's going on there in a minute. Um, but uh, to do that I've had to actually change the sketch on the Arduino to use PPM so that'll give me another four switches or another. Previously it was just using one switch to wake up the rover and then two channels for this and I needed a fourth one and I had a hell of a time doing it with that stupid pulse in function that was uh, in the sketch by default so to get around that I had to change it to PPM which gives me more channels but I also had more problems to get around with because PPM detection would interfere with the software serial that the Arduino is using to talk to the rover control power module anyway <laughs> so we'll get into that in a little bit more detail later on but let me just flip this switch here and you'll see I'm not not driving it and it's not quite going where I thought it was going to go so I might have to switch it off in a second but uh, it's not bad oh it's going to go through the gate at least Alright, well it's actually kind of going where it should. So let's have a look at the web interface. I think last time I showed you this, there were just these three lines at the top. So everything else here I'll mention a little bit about what that does now. Uh, I'm looking at it in the map view rather than satellite because I needed to click on these cells to do editing. And it's a bit awkward when they're so small. But I discovered that if you look at it in map view, you can actually zoom in two more levels than you can with satellite. This may differ depending on how detailed the aerial photography is at that particular location, but where I am here, uh, if I click on satellite, it zooms me back out to this level, so that's the finest I can get. So for most of what I'm going to do here, I will look at it in map so that I can zoom in a bit more like this. Um, anyway, so uh, the rover is inside the garage there and as you can see this is the house and I've tidied it up quite nicely because I do now have some means of removing cells and manually adding some where I want to without having to drive the rover there to put them on the map uh, and this path here is the path that was searched and the rover was trying to follow that starting from the green marker and heading to the red marker the red marker is the destination the green marker is what I'm calling the cursor 
and in normal operation you would do a search so that's this one here and you would normally start from where the rover is because it has to drive from where it is to the destination but just to demonstrate as I was doing before I moved the cursor here and I had from cursor clicked so that for example if I move the cursor here this is a control right mouse click and if I do a search from this point you'll see that it will start from the cursor whereas if I uncheck this then it's going to search from the closest point on the accessible area to where it is and then go to the destination like that so that's what these uh, that's what the from cursor is show working will show which cells of the graph let me just put this over here so it will show you which cells of the uh, graph I guess it's a graph um, that were investigated on the way to trying to find the destination so I've used a pretty simple A star algorithm and the weight is just the typical weight so it's the cost that it took to get to a cell plus the cost or the um, Euclidean, what do you call it, Pythagorean distance from that cell to the destination. So it's just standard A star. But I have changed it a little bit to expand also the neighbors of the neighbors of the cell that gets added to the queue. So if you don't know what A star is, just ignore this. But um, so if I start from here, now normally. <clears throat> Normally you would not open any cells in this direction, but as I was saying just now, this is the neighbor of the neighbor of the cell that got put into the candidate list. Um, and I found that that was quite helpful to to not miss some small gaps. Um, turns out that when I tidied up my map like I have here, there are not actually that many small gaps around, so it may not have been that useful but it didn't really make it any slower so um, I just left it like that this is all running in JavaScript on the client at the moment which is not ideal as I'll show you a little bit later in one of my examples I went out to the end of the bridge and then I wanted to come back but I couldn't because I was too far away from the house so the uh, <laughs> the client was not able to do the search to get back home so it doesn't have a functional return to home fe feature at the moment which is kind of a bummer um, what else have we got here? Show working, I just did that from cursor. Uh, okay, so avoid edges. Uh, let me just do the search again. Normally, I'll put the start position over here. If I turn avoid edges off, it does a much more simple search using the neighbors directly, and it's not going to avoid any squares which are on the edge of the map and I wanted it to try and avoid going right up to the edges of the accessible area because the resolution of the GPS is not that great and these squares are only rounded to the nearest meter anyway so where possible especially for narrow areas like this and the gate I did not really want it to be going scrunched up against the side of the map like that so what this avoid edges checkbox will do is um, I forget exactly how I did this now but basically it prefers not to go in those cells if it can so it'll try and go to a cell that has at least seven neighbors or there's a little bit complex to explain here but if I turn that avoid edges on you'll see that and I'll do the same search now oh okay um, yeah it's it's going a little bit further away from the edges and this also makes it possible to get through a location where there are only two cells wide like this without being too close to the edge so if I do this normal search again we'll see it's right up there which is not very good where you do have a fair bit of space to get through so if you're driving it manually through here it's no problem at all but this kind of a search result is not that great so the avoid edges helps you to put it um, right through the middle there as well and the reason that we saw it sort of flickering a bit there is because this search result is actually being put into the database so the second time it showed up was actually being read from the database uh, so it's a little bit strange but the if it's not in the database after the well basically the rover needs to have the 
whole search path in the database to know where to go without being dependent on the Wi-Fi connection, basically. Um, what else have I got to explain here? Okay, so let's have a look at these. Uh, generate fill lets me put a put the cursor somewhere, and if I click that, it will generate a square of this many cells around it. So if I put this over here and I say um, 5, it gives me a square like that. And if it's already, if the cells are already there, it won't fill them in. So it's just going to leave it like that. And clear fill lets me get rid of that. And um, flood fill does what you might expect. Let me just see if I can uh, put one in here. I'm not sure. I think flood fill might work here. I'm not sure if I have to accept it or not, but let me try this. Flood fill. Yeah, okay. So this is probably the most commonly used one because when you drive around the perimeter of things to define the map, you end up with empty spaces in the middle that you want to fill. Um, so the green cells here are the candidates for what will be filled in in the database if I click Accept Fill. So at this point, nothing's in the database, and I don't want it to because I just wanted to show you how it works without actually changing anything. Uh, at this point, I can also click these to trim away some stuff that I don't want, like this. Uh, and remove cells lets me, for example, if I click this one and just click remove cells, that cell will now be removed and I just want to put it back so I'm going to generate fill and accept fill to put that back. Uh, so that is how I have been tidying up the map. Uh, it's not fully filled in down here, I just went to that first sort of crossroads at the moment, but I'll do a little bit more of it later on. This was enough to drive up and down these roads a little bit and around the house from one side to the other and back again and just sort of get an idea of how the accuracy was going to be working at the current point. Now there's way too much source code involved in this to look at in a video so I'll just show you some of the libraries and uh, resources that I've used and maybe just a little snippet of code here and there uh, just the interesting parts. So most of the changes in this update were related to I squared C usage, which I had not done on the Orange Pi before. And I found this wiring Pi library. Oh, it's actually already using this, but I hadn't used it for I squared C. Um, so it's for the Raspberry Pi, but I found that this documentation worked exactly the same on the Orange Pi port that I was using as well. And it's very, very easy to use. Um, so I'll put a link to this page in the description. And um, it's just a few functions there. I think it was just that one or maybe that one I think I used and that was about it um, and I did not actually use that directly with the compass because I found this other useful resource which is a HMC 5883 compass um, convenience header class kind of a thing uh, it's just a one header there you go header only library quite convenient those things aren't they and this lets you declare this variable here as a compass and then initialize it and then um, do a read and then it also does a lot of the annoying calculations of scaling the values and stuff so that you get values that you actually want and it will also calculate for you the orientation in degrees and radians as well. Um, I actually did not use this output directly because I wanted to use my own calibrated values so I copied and pasted some source code that I had used for my return to home radio control car a couple of years ago and use these values and read those for 20 seconds or so at the beginning and turned the wheelchair around and around uh, and then stored the average and the min and the max of those values to a file to use for calibration later uh, so I did not use that one but if you want to get a simple compass up and running with your Raspberry Pi or Orange Pi this library is an incredibly easy way to do it. There is still one problem I'm having though in that Every time you start it up, it seems to be about a only a 20% chance that the compass will start up and give you values correctly. More or less, maybe not that bad, let's say 60% of the time it doesn't work. And what I mean by doesn't work is all these values that you get here are just the same values every single time. So I'm sort of thinking that maybe this init function is not doing something correctly or maybe it needs to have a delay 
somewhere to allow the compass to actually digest the settings that you're giving it here. I put in some delays but it didn't make any difference. So for now I just have to be careful to remember every time I start it up, um, start up the program that runs on the Orange Pi that is, I have to just check that it is actually giving me actual compass values instead of garbage. Here is some of the code that's running on the Orange Pi. Uh, it's a bit of an eyeful to look at it all at once, but I'm just going <laughs> to focus on a couple of lines here, don't worry. Uh, and the way this works is every fifth of a second, if the GPS position has changed, it will check if it is now within 1.5 meters of the first point in the path that it's trying to reach. And if it has reached that, then it will mark that as reached and it will go on to the next point in the path. Uh, so that's my target distance is 1.5 meters at the moment for that. Um, but what I wanted to show you really was the way that the joystick direction is being sent. So I have organized it so that if the joystick is in the center, it's 0, 0 for these two speed and direction values. So you could think of this as a pitch and roll if you're more used to quadcopter or plane controls for joysticks. Um, but the speed basically just determines how fast it's going to move forwards and direction. Well, a combination of these will de define how it moves. So it's actually a little bit easier than controlling a radio controlled car, I've found, um, in that the way you can do this, if provided that you use your numbers as negative 1 to positive 1 like this, all you need to do once you've de decided or calculated what the target bearing is, in this case degrees, um, and I think I made it so that straight ahead was zero degrees and this direction east was 90 degrees I think it was and this is negative 90 degrees and then these will be sort of minus 180 down here as long as you define everything like that uh, all you need to do is take the cosine and sine of the bearing and that will give you the values for the speed and direction output and as the rover turns to face the right way, this will automatically update and everything will just work out re really, really conveniently and nicely. That's all you need to do for that, for the position of the joystick calculation. And as I, I think I showed in one of my earlier videos that the rover will not go backwards as fast as it does forwards. So even if you happen to be facing directly away from the target point and your joystick value ends up to be almost directly backwards, it's not going to start racing along backwards very quickly it's going to go kind of slowly and inevitably it will turn one way or the other and as it does the target point will become more to the let's say it goes to the right it will become more to one way or the, than the other and as it does the more it becomes that way the more it will tend to turn towards it until you end up facing forwards so to speak so the direction of the rover is heading towards the point and then it will go at its fastest speed forwards and it all looks very natural uh, at least to my mind, and all you need to do to go make, make, make it happen is this cosine and sine, so it's very convenient. Um, so once we have the output speed and direction, these are these values here from negative 1 to positive 1. Um, I'm scaling them a little bit so that if we're moving forwards, it's only going to move at 0 0.4 of the capability that it has because it's quite fast, at least too, too fast for me to be, feel comfortable with it moving autonomously at full speed going forwards. Uh, if it's moving backwards, like I say, it's quite slow, so I just left that at 1, which is okay. And also the direction, so turning left and right, I made it do that a little bit slower as well, so it's, it's 0 0.6 speed. There seems to be some kind of an expo in these values, by the way, as I was playing around with them. Um, so they've already, they've already scaled these a little bit to make it easier for people who are actually using this as a wheelchair, I guess. Um, right, so this speed scale and direction scale are the values that will be sent to the Arduino and they are done in this function here, apply control output and I've kind of copied the way that the shark bus thing works by setting the uppermost bit or the most significant bit in one of these values to be set. So if it's the speed byte, uh, so I'm con converting these floating point numbers there to single byte values um, and because I'm using one bit to f use as a flag to say whether it's the speed byte or the direction byte uh, that leaves me with only a range of 128 values so 64 is going to be the middle position 
and then whatever the speed is we're going to use that to multiply it by 62 so this will give us a range of um, so if this is negative 1 this will end up being 64 minus 62 so it'll be 2 will be the lowest value and then the highest value will be, will be 126 I didn't want it to go quite to the end so that's why I've used 62 instead of 64 I also found that it went uh, it actually overflowed somewhere along the line too so that's why it's 62 um, and then all we do is we use the functions that I showed you before in the wiring pi library for i squared c and we just write that byte to the Arduino and then we write the other byte to the Arduino and we don't need to use any packet structuring or delineation of data because we have this handy feature we're only sending two bytes of data and one of them is going to have a flag in it on that first bit um, so it's all quite simple as long as this is the only data that we're sending which I think it will this is only this is the only data I will need to be sending here is the sketch that's running on the Arduino after I've modified it a little bit to use PPM uh, I put a define here so that you can switch between using PPM or not using PPM although the state that the sketch is in at the moment it's actually only going to work with PPM and this is for the reason that I mentioned before uh, the pulse in function that's used by the default sketch to get the um, channel values from the receiver is just really crappy um, causes all kinds of problems so in reality if you're not defining this here for PPM it's probably not going to work very well uh, and as you can see I have added um, one more channel here so this is a the channel that I showed you before to decide whether the control will be manual or whether it would be overridden by the info coming in from the I squared C from the orange pie. Uh, so the function that receives data from the I squared C uh, from the orange pie basically it's just a reverse of what we just saw so it checks if the uppermost bit is set and if so then it's going to be the speed value and it just reverses that thing we did with the 64 and the 62 to get values from negative 1 to 1 again uh, and then those are used later on when we're sending things down the shark bus um, one other thing that I wanted to look at here which took me quite a while to figure out is this bit here so at the right at the bottom of the sketch we have this function here which is the PPM interrupt and this had to be changed a little bit because it was messing up the software serial which sends information to the rover's power module on the shark bus um, sorry where am I loop okay so here we are this is the oh god this is the loop function so if we look at the bottom of that what I actually had to do is at the end of each loop we're going to wait for the full set of PPM pulses to come in and fortunately we do have enough time to do that PPM at least with the receiver I'm using is uh, about 50 times per second you get a full set of pulses so what I'm doing is attaching the interrupt waiting for the full set of PPM pulses to come in that so that's the the um, interrupt function that we saw at the bottom of the file will do its business and when we've done that we detach the interrupt and we need to detach this interrupt to make sure that the software serial is going to work correctly so we don't want this interrupt to be in in place when we're doing this other stuff like sending general information packet so it's quite a hacky way to do it but it does work um, I don't like it much but it does work so this these variables here are just some supporting stuff that are inside that um, interrupt function that need to be set to false before it starts running so it does work but um, there's one sort of a slight niggling problem that I came across and you may have noticed it before when I was sitting outside showing you at the beginning of this video even though I wasn't touching the joystick you could hear the brakes on the motors clicking and clacking off and on so it seems like occasionally it is getting values outside the dead band of the joystick to the point where it thinks it's going to start moving and then it immediately stops moving so 
something's a little bit off here and probably could use a little bit of looking into some time in the future but as long as you don't mind the clicking and clacking of those motors occasionally it doesn't seem to be a problem because it's not bad enough that the chair will I mean the rover will actually start driving somewhere all it seems to do is click the motors click the brakes off and on on the motors so I'm just gonna leave that like that for now and I haven't had any problems but yes it is very hacky